Okay, over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee on uh, Wednesday, 17th of March, 2021. Um, I think we all know a procedure now, how we run these meetings, but I will have to ask you if you are in attendance. So I will go through your names, and if you're here, please say yay. If I don't hear anything from you, I know obviously you, no, they're not here. So Keith Coleman Cook, Councillor Coleman Cook. Yes, here. Councillor Alban. Yeah, here, Chair. Uh, Councillor Bayford. Here, Chair. Councillor Curry. Here, Chair. Councillor Dennis, I know we have apologies for. Councillor Patmore. Councillor Patmore, I'll come back to Pat. Uh, Councillor Mike Garner. I'm here, Chair. Thank you. Councillor David Hart. Here, Hello, Chair. Councilor. Thank you. Councillor Heather Keane. Here, Chair. Uh, Councillor Paul Moore. Present, Chair. Uh, Councillor Matthew Scott. I'll come back. I know sometimes he is a little bit late because of work. Uh, Councillor George Roseski. Here, Chair, and Councillor Scott has said he's here in the uh, uh, messaging. Just spotted it. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Roseski. Uh, Councillor Wright. Here, Chair. Uh, myself, obviously, I'm here. Uh, just go back to Councillor Pat Moore. Nope. Right, we'll try again uh, later. Okay, members, um, if you have technical difficulties during the meeting, then please contact the Democratic Service Officers who are on call, who will attempt to assist you. Today's officer is Katie. Her number is 577046 and will be on the chat box. So if you have any problems, give it a call. I would ask all participants to mute their microphones when you are not speaking. This minimizes background noise and will help everyone in this listening to the proceedings. Microphones must only be on if the participant has been granted permission to speak. To gain permission, please briefly indicate on the chat box to the right of your screen, and I will then make a note and come back to you once the person speaking has finished. Uh, would everybody present please ensure that their mobile phones are turned to silent and that they are not used to make or receive phone calls whilst the meet is in progress. Please also refrain from checking emails or conducting any other business and ensure that you are in a quiet room free from distractions for the duration of the meeting. Also please note that this meeting is being live streamed for members of the public and the following meeting will be is being recorded so it will be available on the council's youtube channel also just to mention officers with us today uh, ian limonston planning applications manager annabelle hemmins um, planning officer uh, james clapston um, democratic services kate brewer democratic services and our legal officer suki montague uh, members requesting to speak under Council Procedure 20.1, so if members would make a note, uh, Councillor Bailey on item 4A, Upton County Primary School, Councillor Pugh on 4C and 4D, Garden Cottage, Durock, Councillor Bob Bayford on 4F at 8 Percy Avenue. If there are any other members who are listening or asked to be part of this uh, meeting uh, to speak under 20.1, could they let me know now, please? Okay. Just reading Councillor Hart's message here, yeah, that's fine. Um, item agenda one is apologies for absence. I have received uh, apologies from Councillor Dennis. Uh, are there any other apologies? Uh, thank you, Councillor Scott, for letting us know that you're here. Um, I think we're missing Councillor Pat Moore at the moment. 
Agenda item two, declarations of interest. Uh, I'm aware of one at this stage, which is Councillor Auburn, who is declaring an interest in item 4E, uh, which is Margate Football Club. And Councillor Auburn is aware that he will have to shut down completely and not be part of the proceedings. Are there any other declarations of interest? No, thank you. Agenda item three, approving in the minutes. Do members agree that the minutes of the planning meeting held on the 17th of February 2021 be approved? Could I have a proposer, please? I'll propose oh, that change. No. Take your pick. <coughs> Councillor Moore, Pat, yes, uh, Paul Moore. Propose seconded, please. I'll second that, yeah. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Coleman Cook, thank you very much. If members agree, agreed. Sounds like it, thank you very much. Uh, agenda item four a schedule of planned applications and public speaking. Uh, once again, members, I'm sure you know that site visits cannot take place. Um, hopefully, as we move through the opening of various uh, places that we will be able to do so um, if we need to. Uh, the following items have been reserved for public speaking. So again, if you could make a note of this, items 4A, 4C, 4D, 4E and 4F. Thank you. Uh, point of information, uh, I called upon the planning officer um, Mr. Livingston to give us an update information regarding agenda item 4A, Upton County Primary School and agenda item 4E, Margate Football Club. Ian. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is just a point of clarification on, on two items as mentioned. So on item 4A, Upton County Primary School, the wording of condition 11, which is the opening hours condition of the hall, has been clarified following confirmation from the agent and environmental health and would now read that uh, the building hereby approved shall not be used other than between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4.15 p.m. by the school Monday to Friday during term time, 4.30 p.m. and 10 p.m. by the community Monday to Friday during term time, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday to Friday during the school holidays, and 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. 10 p.m. Saturdays and bank holidays, and 9 a.m. to uh, 8 p.m. on Sundays. And so the wording of the condition 11 is updated accordingly in the officer's recommendation to planning committee. And I will obviously that's going to be one of the issues that's going to be discussed later. Um, and on item 4E, Margate Football Ground. Uh, the description of development has been updated to remove reference to a retail unit which formed part of the original proposal but was removed during the course of the process. Uh, so now the description of the proposal states uh, erection of 120 bed hotel and ancillary facilities including restaurant, newsstands, studio spaces, cafe, club shop, club offices and car parking. Uh, the plan condition which is uh, condition two, has also been updated to reflect updated wording on the ground floor plan uh, on the East Stand, which will be shown to members during presentations later. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, moving on to agenda item 4A, which is Upton County Primary School in Agenda Road, Broadstairs. I would ask uh, our legal officer to read out uh, notice more public speaking statement in favour of the application and a public state statement objecting to the application. Suki. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll read out the statement of objecting from Mrs Dungar first. She says, as the main spokesperson for the Edge End Road Residence Liaison Group, it has been tasked to me to speak on behalf of the majority of the residents. First, we would like to thank Councillor Bailey for speaking on our behalf regarding the uh, Viking Academy Trust's proposal 
as per the generic document, which would allow hirers of the new sports hall to apply for an extension beyond the 10 p.m. curfew and for them to also apply for an occasional permission license allowing alcohol. We look forward to this wording being removed from the relevant document, which was submitted as part of the VAT's planning application, so as to avoid any further misunderstandings. Parking has always been a problem for residents and there is little on any documents to explain fully the provision to be provided. At the very least, both the main car park, the area in front of the school, and the overflow car park, the area to the right, would need to be available and accessible as well as at least two, if not all three gates to be open. This would allow vehicles to enter and exit without having to try to pass each other in opposite directions, where it is clearly too narrow to do so. There will be occasions when the sports hall, swimming pool and the field, and possibly even the main building, are in use at the same times, with an increased need for parking capacity. Therefore, without adequate parking spaces, Edge End Road will become a car park again. We therefore request more information regarding the VAT's proposals as to how they plan to accommodate the inevitable increase in traffic using the school's facilities. There is a vague mention of the pedestrian gate from Broadstairs Road and the gate from the footpath at the back of the school to be opened. I can assure you that Mrs Judd and Ms Cobb would object to having people coming and going so close to their properties out of school times, partly because of the issue of noise, but mainly from the concerns of a serious breach of security. As for the idea of people walking across the entire length of the school field from the footpath along the rear of the school in bad weather and or at night, this surely cannot be a serious consideration. We are not against the new sports hall per se, but as neighbours, we feel that we should be awarded more consideration and given more say. Had we been informed and consulted more at an earlier stage, we would not be having to make these objections now. We would just remind everyone that this is predominantly a residential area. I will now read out the statement in favour from Mr Curtis, Chair of Governors at Upton Junior School. This application is to replace an existing sports facility for pupils, which is totally unfit for purpose, with a new one intended primarily for their use. The school has received a grant of government funds for this purpose. In accordance with government policy, we shall offer the sports hall as an asset for use by the wider community when not in use for the school. The relatively small size of the building, this is not a full-sized sports centre, means that it will only be suitable for a range of activity involving limited numbers, badminton, keep fit groups, yoga, dance classes, etc. The great majority of concerns expressed by residents appear to stem from unfortunate misunderstandings of one of the two documents added to the portal on December 24th in response to a request from the planning officer following a site visit on December 9th for further details of the conditions for hire to the community. This document is the school's lettings policy. This, this is a generic policy applying to all buildings in the three schools which make up the Viking Academy Trust. As such, it is a catch-all document designed to cover any eventuality. The fact that the policy mentions hiring out buildings for social events, at one point mentions alcohol, and at another talks of the possibility of extending hire beyond 10pm on rare occasions, coupled with the fact that the plan includes a small kitchen, has led some residents to fear that the school intends to offer the sports hall as a commercial venue for all sorts of social occasions. This is not the case. The design of the hall does not lend itself to such lettings. Although we can foresee that there may be some small demand for sports related children's parties for pupils in the early evening and for club presentation evenings, these would clearly not be regular occurrences. Had we wished to offer the school regularly as a commercial venue for social gatherings, we would have been aggressively marketing the school hall which is not only better suited and equipped for such purposes, but also has an attendant and far more extensive kitchen. It is perhaps worth pointing out that one of the relatively few social occasions on which the hall has been hired for social occasions out in the recent years is the Mayor of Broadstairs annual charity quiz night. Concerns about lack of parking seem to stem from the misapprehension of some residents that the sports hall will be let out for community use while the school is in session. In fact, as the proposed timetable posted on the planning site makes clear, it will only be available for hire when the school is not in session. At such times, there is ample parking available on the school site. 
Several thousand pounds have been spent over the last year in improving the surface of the car park and improving signage to deter cars from exiting the site in the wrong direction. As far as noise is concerned, given the sighting of the proposed building at the rear of the school building away from Edge End Road, the fact that the sports hall component only has one external door and, being designed for sports, only has limited high-level window space, we do not expect this to be a significant issue. As noted earlier, we do not intend to let the sports hall out for the sorts of occasions at which loud music would be played. However, as is stated in the school's lettings policy, we are happy to ensure that noise levels are kept within parameters laid down by environmental health. We are also happy for it to be a planning condition that community use of the sports hall should not extend past 10 p.m. It is worth noting that, anxious to avoid being seen as preempting the granting of planning permission, the school has not informed parents and pupils of the proposed development. Had it done so, we have no doubt that, with over 500 pupils, there would have been several hundred comments from local residents in support of the application. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Suki. Um, I'm not sure whether any members or staff um, officers realise I disappeared from the screen there. Not sure what happened. Um, uh, technology, but I've moved back on. Thank you. Uh, I call upon uh, Councillor Bailey to speak as Ward Councillor, please. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Um, I think Mrs. Dungars actually has said most of what I was going to say. I've actually facilitated this call in on their behalf. I am very positively in favour of this sports hall. Um, I think it offers um, a great uh, facility for both school children and for the wider community. Um, but there is, however, one thing I do agree. I, I, I mean, I do know that the um, residents have several uh, different um, concerns, but I think most of them are either surmountable or, or the benefits of the new sports hall outweigh them. But I do agree with them on the fact that I don't think it should be used for a function, a social function space. It is a residential area. And no matter what the um, there seems to have been a bit of a breakdown between in relations between the academy trust and the residents, and which is unfortunate. Um, but they do actually say in their terms and conditions uh, that uh, you know they will allow um, permission for alcoholic drinks if there is um, an occasional permission license, and uh, they, there are references to allowing it to be used as a function um, hall. Um, TDC have, unfortunately, the um, the response came in after the call in, and also I think the environmental health um, things went up on the portal after the call in. So, um, environmental health has stipulated some conditions, which I would um, I would ask members if they would re enforce, um, especially the time curfews, the noise limiters, um, and I would also. Uh, ask members to consider adding a condition that would preclude the use of alcohol on that site as it is a residential area. Um, I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bailey. Um, I now call upon the planning officer, who I believe is Annabelle, uh, to give the details of this application. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen. Uh, hopefully members can now see my screen. I can. Thank you. Um, this is the application site outlined in red. We have Edge End Road running um, north to south along the right hand side of the slide. And the footpath that's been uh, mentioned running to the rear of the site here the sports hall that's being referred to is in this location here so this is the um, existing sports hall and the replacement one would sit in the same location albeit it would be slightly larger um, so we have an aerial photograph of the site again we can see edge end road um, the, uh, the main um, buildings of the school the swimming pool building and the sports hall as existing here 
and you can note that the surrounding and boundaries of the site um, are heavily landscaped and there is a good amount of tree coverage around the borders of the site. So zooming in on the site, we have Edgin Road on the right hand side here. We have the main school complex, the swimming pool building here and the existing sports hall. And you can see there are three trees adjacent to the existing sports hall, which are actually proposed to be failed to accommodate the new sports hall. But I will come back to talk about those later. Um, so you have some photographs of the existing sports hall. So the main school classroom buildings are on the right hand side of the slide. This is the rear of the existing sports hall with a decking area here. Again, the rear of the sports hall and you can see the school, the school field. Um, this is looking at the other side of the sports hall, the swimming pool building, the sports hall here. And these are the trees that are proposed to be felled. Um, just some quick photographs of the parking that is available on the site. So we have parking area here with entrance from Edge End Road. This is the parking area, which is again from that same entrance. So we've actually looked at the photographs of the sports hall as it stands now in this location. The dotted line is the actual footprint of the post um, sports hall and the parking area that sits in this location here. So this is the existing site plan. So the main school building, classroom buildings are here and here. We have the end of the swimming pool building here. This is the existing sports hall. And these are the three trees that are actually um, proposed to be removed. Uh, the application was accompanied by a tree survey and none of the trees on site are protected by virtue of a tree preservation order or by virtue of being in a conservation area. The, all but one of the trees on site are identified as being category C and that is the case with these three um, trees here that are to be felled but their provision has been made and is secured by condition for replacement of the three trees elsewhere within the site. So this is the um, proposed sports hall. As noted, you can see the dotted red line here is sort of the area of where the existing sports hall is. So it is a larger area and it might be difficult to see, but the um, canopies of the existing trees that are to be removed are outlined in red by dotted lines. So the maximum height of the sports hall would be 7.9 metres and then it drops down in the area of the change rooms and kitchen area to a height of 3.6 and at its widest part is 17.4 um, metres and again the width dropped us down to 10 metres at this smaller element to the rear. So just a series of elevations, so we have the existing south elevation and as you can see that it is annotated, that's the area that's going to be demolished. Um, this is the proposed south elevation, so you can see it is higher in this part here and then it drops down. And again, this is the north elevation, you can see the swimming pool building on the left hand side now. And this is sports hall with the trees covering it that would be demolished. And this is the proposed north elevation. So again, you can see the higher part of the proposed sports hall, <coughs> excuse me, and then the lower, lower part, which contains the changing rooms and the kitchen. <coughs> excuse me. This is the existing um, rear elevation, west elevation. So this is the one we saw in the photographs. This is the decking area. And again, you can see it is the domed, the dome shape of the building that will be demolished. This is the proposed um, rear elevation, so you can see the smaller part of the sports hall and then the larger part, which be the main sort of sports facility. This is the east elevation and again the proposed east elevation. So these are the proposed floor plans. So as stated, this is the main sort of sports area where games and activities would take place. These are the changing rooms and a store associated with it. We have um, toilets here and a small kitchen facility. 
So to summarise, the application is for an updated sports hall, which would be provided for mainly for school use, but providing, as is common, for use by the local community. Concerns have been raised about noise and disturbance and hours of use. Um, it is noted that there are several conditions that members will have seen on the report. Um, they include um, noise limitations um, suggested by environmental health and also the hours um, of opening and use by both the school and the um, community. And obviously, um, as Mr Livingston has pointed out, that um, condition has been updated, but the latest opening hours would be till 10 p.m. 10 p.m. But or and then on a Sunday, 8 p.m. would be the latest use for the site. Concerns have also been raised about car parking on site. KCC Highways have commented on the application and raised no objection on the basis that um, the existing parking on site is made available for community use of the site. So the officer recommendation is one for approval. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Annabelle. Um, if I may just come in here, um, uh, Councillor Bailey has mentioned some further conditions. Uh, I have to ask members at this stage, and I'm sure you know, um, they could be looked at at a later date, but at the moment you are discussing and um, obviously what's in front of you. Uh, so I move that the officer's recommendation is to approve. Could the vice chair please second? I'll second that, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Coleman-Cook. Um, I have a few speakers here. Uh, Councillor Bayford. Councillor Bayford, Jill. Sorry, Chair. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very much in favour of this application. Um, I think it offers great opportunities for the school and for um, social, social um, gatherings afterwards. I don't think there's much chance of a school sports hall um, allowing events to get out of hand. Uh, I think it would be... a, a a great pity for the government funding to not to be utilised. Um, there are several conditions which I think allay many of the fears by the residents. There's just one question. I, I wonder whether Annabelle can tell us, um, have you any idea how many cars could be accommodated in the parking available? Please. Can you, can you do that, Annabelle? No, unfortunately I don't. It isn't, um, as we've seen from the pictures, Hopefully, I, I can share them again if need be. Yes. But it isn't um, demarked, so it will depend no, on uh, it, how people park as to the number that can be accommodated right. in the space. But we do have the KCC Highway comment that they don't yeah. raise objection as long as the car park so is Probably isn't an issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bayford. Councillor Alban. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> yes, as, <coughs> excuse me. As Councillor Bayford has just said, I'm fully supportive of what she just said. Um, I think it'd be a great asset for the school and for the community as a whole. Um, the only issue, the, the only thing that, that does concern me, the, the three mature trees that are being taken out, um, I see they're cat category C. I mean, I think it, it would be a, a benefit to advise the committee what the category C uh, tree actually is and that would be on its on on their worth and and their uh impact on the amenity of the area and can i also be um uh, can i also ask please um the replacement trees are part of the landscaping i take it to be uh, could the replacement trees be mature trees and not uh just uh small re replacements which will take a number of years to grow uh i think that would be bene beneficial and and would certainly help to um lessen the impact of the building thank you chair uh thank you councillor alban uh annabelle can you come back on that at all yes i can i'm not a tree 
um, of officer. So I don't know the precise details of the categories A, B and C, but nonetheless, they run with A being the best and most um, established and healthy trees and of the most aesthetic value um, down to C, which are a lesser quality and not considered to be as important visually and aesthetically. And they could be considered to be of a lesser quality. And on this particular site, no category A trees were <coughs> found. And there was one category B tree on the site, which was um, defined as category B because of its unusual species as well as its prominent location. Um, in terms of the replacement trees, if they are um, included in condition six of the report, which relates to ecological enhancements and details and to be submitted and agreed. So it could, and that in, does include details of the replacement trees. So we could look to secure mature trees at that stage or to sort of um, ensure that we do not lose um, mature trees and gain you know, very small trees that don't necessarily have at this moment um, aesthetic, uh, an equivalent aesthetic value. So I think there is scope within condition six as it stands to agree details of those replacement trees. Can I come back, Chair? By all means, Councillor Alban. <coughs> uh, in that case, Chair, providing I think that the officers can agree or, or get the get the agreement from the school to uh, plant mature trees in in place of the three that's been removed. I would most happily uh, support this application. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Alban. I, I was going to come to say myself that we could, or an officer could come back to you on the cat categories of the trees, but um, I think you have an answer there. So, thank you very much, um, Councillor Rozeski. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd like to uh, state my support for this application. Um, the school and uh, sports halls in schools and that are very key to communities and they, they're often rented out uh, to, to interested parties, um, as they say, for badminton clubs, judo clubs, etc., etc. And having a small kitchen uh, is not a bad thing. Um, as for the licensing, we do have a licensing committee that can deal with all those kind of things, and I don't think that that should really uh, be an issue for us. Our issue, I think, is, is, is purely whether or not the building is right. Uh, I do think it's right. The school have looked at it. The government funding is there. We should go ahead with this uh, without any hesitation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. you taken some words from me there, Councillor Rozeski, with the licensing board. Um, that situation does arise obviously that they would have to have a look at that um uh, councillor garner thank you yeah well i had a couple of points i wanted to make you've clarified one around the licensing um i mean on the whole i agree with the other councillors who've spoken and i agree with councillor bailey this is a on the whole a very good proposal good for the um good for the neighborhood and good for the town um i share others concerns around the loss of these category c trees which according to the um the what i've got in front of me category c trees are trees of low quality with an estimated remaining life expectancy of at least 10 years or young trees with a stem diameter below 150 millimeters so i guess these are the more the former than the latter um, and i would like to see um some mature trees placed there rather than small saplings um instead and i'm sure in fact that the um the broad stairs town council tree warden i'm certain would be more than happy to work with the um developer to make sure that appropriate trees are placed on the site there so thank you uh thank you councillor garner uh councillor Pullmore. Yes, thank you, Chair. Obviously, being far down the list, most of my points have already been covered. Um, <clears throat> but I'd just like to uh, give my point that I'm in full support of this application. I agree with Councillor Auburn, Garner and Rosetsky uh, regarding uh, mature trees and uh, the fact that this will be um, 
a community asset, a school asset, and it will develop and enhance the well-being of all the children at that school. Um, and I also agree with Councillor Garner that Borsis Town Council Tree Warden can obviously support the developer in identifying uh, the type of trees that are best suitable for the area. Uh, and as long as they are mature and substantial, they will last for, for eternity as long as the building will be. So all those points uh, have been covered. Um, so I'm full in support of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, Councillor Hart. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I do think it's a good, a good um, general overview of what should be going on. I have slight concerns about mature trees because a mature tree could cost, um, depending on size, it could cost a couple of thousand pounds. So I think that's a bit excessive. Um, I think what we need to do here is um, think of the children at the school. Rather than spending thousands on mature trees to go in, um, a good sized sapling would be more beneficial to the pupils than to the general concept of the building and the, the, the look of the place. And I don't think you need to go for overly mature trees. Um, I'd rather money spent on the children just have a small sapling going in, to be honest. Um, but that's just my personal view, sorry. No problem, Councillor Hart. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I can't see any other members wishing to speak. Uh, so members, I'm going to put this to you, which is, uh, uh, obviously, the recommendation is for approval. Uh, once again, I'm going through your names. Um, if you're for, please say so, or against, or you're abstaining, uh, please let me know. Uh, Councillor Coleman Cook. For. Councillor Alban. For. Councillor Bayford. For. Councillor Curry. For. Councillor Garner. Four. Councillor Hart. Four, Chair. Councillor Keane. Four. I will try Councillor Patmore whether she has joined us. I'm not sure whether she has. No. Okay, Councillor Paul Moore. Four, Chair. Councillor Rzeski. Four. Councillor Scott. Four, Chair. Councillor Wright. Four, Chair. Uh, myself, I'm four. I believe that is unanimous and carried. Thank you very much, members. Right, moving on now to item 4D. I hope I've got the right order here. Bear with me a moment, uh, members. Putting stuff down on the floor, which I shouldn't. Item 4C, I beg your pardon, uh, which is the Garden Cottage Durlock Minster. I will ask our officers to read out a public speaking statement in favour of the application. Suki, please. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Yes, this is a statement in favour from Mr Errington, who's the agent. This public speaking presentation relates solely to the listed building aspects of the development. It is fully accepted that planning legislation requires regard to be had to the desirability of preserving listed buildings their setting and any features of special architectural or historic interest which they possess. It is further acknowledged that great weight should be given to these matters when weighing up the impact of proposed development upon designated heritage assets. It is, however, considered to be vitally important that due regard should be had to these matters based upon the facts of each individual case. In this instance, the two features to be lost comprise a modern sash window installed as part of a 1970s extension, <coughs> excuse me, and a bay window introduced in the early 2000s in connection with a later edition consented in 1999. Whilst it is recognised that the 1970s sash window was in place at the point in time when the building was first listed, it cannot be agreed that it therefore enjoys a degree of heritage significance worthy of its retention. Its presence when the building was first listed in 1986 does not alter the fact that it formed part of a single storey, flat, felt roofed extension, which could very well have been built under permitted development, as without the listing in place, consent would only have been required if it had exceeded a certain volume. Also, while it was designed to reflect the windows in the older part of the property, its size, position and relationship with other features at the rear of the property are such that it does not appear cohesive with the rest of the building. The same conclusion must also be reached in respect to the bay window. 
which was introduced even later and being constructed of a mixture of UPVC and timber cannot either be regarded as possessing any heritage significance since it has only been present for some 20 years, which is not considered to represent a significant period of time relative to the age of the main listed building of some 300 years. The applicants fully understand that the evolution of a listed building can form an important element of the significance of the heritage asset. In this case, the later addition of the boundary wall and outbuilding. However, these were added in the 18th and early 19th centuries and by virtue of their age, positively contribute to the historic significance of the asset. Correspondingly, it is equally and widely acknowledged that far more contemporary additions do not contribute to significance to the same extent, or indeed at all, which is the situation with the features in question here, which are neither historic nor relate to the historic layout of the listed building. It can therefore only be concluded that there will be no loss of historic fabric arising from this development, no harm to historic significance, and thereby no conflict with NPPF paragraphs 193 or 196. Have you finished? Hello? Sorry, yes, sorry, Chair. Yes, I have finished. Wait, sorry, Suki, you suddenly stopped. Oh, and, sorry, uh, yes, yes, I should have. No, um, don't worry. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Councillor Pugh, as Wall Councillor, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, think, I think that statement um, sums up a lot of the reasons why I think there should be um, <clears throat> granted permission far better than I will be able to say, but I, I will try my best. Um, as, as many of you will know from reading the, uh, the agenda and the report, um, I called this in as one of the ward councillors. Um, one of my many reasons for doing so was that I believe that actually um, this application will do more good than harm for the local area. And whilst I understand and appreciate that uh, the cottage itself is situated within uh, the Minster Conservation Area, um, very familiar with the area and particularly with um, part of this kind of extension link to the cottage. Um, many of you may or may not know that from Church Road itself, it's very hard to see um, into this property um, and and the negative impact that uh, that this change could do uh, to the surrounding area, seeing as there's a very large brick wall. Um, and I invite many of the, of, the, of the committee to have a look on Google Street View to see that the Google car, when it went round many years ago, uh, struggled to see properly over the wall um, and to see this um, this small link extension. Um, and I think the, the new one, if it's approved tonight, uh, will be very much the same. Um, again, as I stated previously, uh, the sash window dates from the 1970s uh, with PVC. Um, I don't think that it can continue to have this in the building provides any real architectural merit um, or heritage. Um, and for that, as well as many other reasons, I would urge uh, the planning committee to grant permission for this application tonight. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Pugh. Um, whilst the planning officer, which I believe is Ian, on this occasion to outline the report. Thank you, Chair. I'll just present my screen. Okay, hopefully members can uh, see the screen now. Yep. Uh, so this application is for listed building consent. Um, just to make it absolutely clear to members, this is considering the impact on the listed building only for, for this application. Um, so members will be aware that um, section 66 of the Listed Building Conservation Area, uh, Conservation Area Act 1990 requires the local authority uh, to, um, to have a presumption or a duty to preserve or enhance the character of listed buildings with regards to the decisions which it makes with regards to consent such as this. Um, the listed building in question uh, is Garden Cottage, which is outlined on uh, this slide here. So you've got Church Street, which wraps around the, the, the top here. Um, then looking at this aerial view you can see the building here itself we'll have a look at some detailed images which will pick up some of the points that have been raised about 
the what age the the different sections of the building were were developed. So you can see Durlock Road runs uh, to um, east to west. Uh, you've got this parking area here, which uh, is accesses some units down here. So there is a route down to the rear for vehicles and pedestrians. So um, and and picking up Councillor Pugh's point, this is. Uh, taken from Google Street View, in fact, uh, just a view just showing from Church Street. So it is actually a slightly elevated position. So this is the listed building itself. So this is actually the rear of the listed building here. Um, we have some photos provided by the applicant which show the sort of inside the garden walls of the listed building. <clears throat> so this is a view of the, the front of the listed building. So um, it's a grade two listed building, um, circa 1700. Um, the listing includes the wall, which we were just looking at. Um, so the view that we were getting was from the other side of this wall here from Church Street. Um, as has already been mentioned, this building was listed in 1986 was when it was listed. Um, in terms of the view of the rear, um, I've got two images to show you. Um, this one um, shows the, the roof forms of some of the extended elements to the rear of the listed building. Um, if I just skip to this image, this makes it a bit clearer. So we're looking from the other side. So that view that we were just looking at is from was from here. Um, so to pick up some of the points that have been raised with regards to the removal of the windows and the location of the extensions, the extension proposed is a single storey flat roof extension, uh, which would remove the, the bay window here and the uh, sash window here. Now, this section of the building here with the with the brick um, section um, dates to around the early 70s, um, as has been mentioned with um with a, a approval being given i think it was 72 uh, and then the listing of the building occurred as mentioned in in 1986. this section here this glazed lean to and the insertion of windows including the bay was as mentioned granted in uh, 1999 so uh, it was listed building consent was granted in 1999 uh, for uh, these this section here so just going around some other images. So here's another image just showing uh, this uh, this part of the, the extended elements. Uh, this is a view. So from that vehicular access that I mentioned earlier uh, that runs around the, the back boundary of the property, uh, this is a view of the side or the, it's the south elevation, but it's the side elevation of the building. And you can see the elements here, um, including the bay window, in fact, um, through the current gap in the, the fence. What I'll be talking about in a minute when looking at some of the plans are uh, a bit of information about what consent has already been granted for in this building so that members are aware of that. Uh, so just to go back and recap, that photo was uh, from outside the site, it's from this location here looking back towards the building. So we're from down here looking back towards. Um, so this is... Um, a site plan showing the layout as approved last year in a planning application and listed building consent. So um, this element here, which is the extension that we were just looking at part of, um, the extended part that we're now considering so was removed from the application, um, but there are, has been approval given for uh, an expansion of uh, the single story element at the moment with some dorm windows going in as well as, um, if I click on, as well as a, a new boundary wall in this section here, the courtyard, and also um, sort of resurfaced turning area. And you will have seen from that image that that started to be uh, implemented. Uh, so just looking again at the, the, the key part and consideration for members on this one, um, this is the area which would be altered. So this is a ground floor plan showing the bay window and uh, the existing sash window. What's proposed is that a flat roof extension would remove those two openings and would extend out. And then this is the roof plan just showing. So this is the consented development here uh, for with the dorm windows at first floor. Uh, and you'll see that this would extend out 
to link to the overhang with the flat roof element increasing. Um, and so this is the side elevation. So you'll recall the photo with the view of this. So here's the bay window. And if you, in the same area, you can see that it's been replaced by a, um, a set of windows with the flat roof extension extending out. And then this is a view that's been provided. Um, apologies for the labeling. It's not the existing as such um, because it's the part of the consented scheme that's there um, when it was submitted. Uh, and you can see that the you can see a little a little change that's been shown there in terms of again the three D perspective that's been given to remove the the window that's present. Just to show you a street scene, so I mentioned about the wall that had been created um, or that had been approved is here. Gated access that we looked through is here. So this is the area of the the building that's being changed. Uh, and this is a, a, a perspective view that's been given, which is showing the, the change in situ. So the flat roof element across here has been extended further um, in terms of close proximity with the road. So going through, again, some of the other visualizations that's been provided, the flat roof element on the top image here that's being extended um, is, is this bit here. And this is an image just showing, again, this is the consented development, but you can see this outcrop that's here is where the flat roof element um, protrudes out. And then this is just a view just showing that it's, it's not visible from viewpoints from Church Street because of the presence of the elements, which we looked at on the, uh, on the previous um, slides and images. Um, so in, the view of the conservation officer um, and the officer in this instance, um, the, the concern is really raised to the, the protrusion of the flat roof element out from the existing. Um, obviously it's acknowledged that um, as has been very clearly outlined, these windows are not original to the building. They're not from the 1700s. Um, that they are considered to have a certain element of merit in terms of the character of the property, in terms of the, the, in, especially in terms of this sash window in terms of the quality uh, of the work that's been put in. Uh, however, it is understood that the particular concerns that have been raised about it's, it doesn't constitute the loss of historic fabric. However, the actual windows themselves um, you know, are considered to contribute towards the character of the property. And as the conservation officer has outlined, the character of listed buildings do change over time. Um, it, and the protrusion out of a flat roof element um, into and and, it, and um, almost blocking the rear elevation of the building um, is considered to result in, in some harm. It has been acknowledged in the report though, that this is less than substantial. However, any harm to a listed building um, has got to be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. And in this instance, there are no public benefits from the proposal. Um, and therefore, um, you know, the protrusion of the flat roof element um, is considered to intrude on the rear elevation of the listed building um, and therefore is considered to detrimentally affect the character of the listed building um, and therefore officer recommendation is is for refusal in this instance. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, right, I move that the officer's recommendation, as you heard, is to refuse. Could the Vice Chair please second? I'll second that, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Common Cook. Um, uh, Councillor Alban. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's a, it's a, um, I, I, I don't know this property at all, but having looking at it at the rear, it's a hodgepodge of uh, it's a hodgepodge of buildings, as far as I can see, to a layman, if you like. Um, I don't see uh, the merit of either the bay window. Uh, the sash window a bit more, but the bay window I don't really see as a merit there. Uh, that actually enhances the existing listed building of which it's attached to. Um, so over, overall, chair, I I I can't see why I could agree to go with the officer's recommendation, and I I I, I don't I don't go along with it. Thank you, chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Alban. Uh, Councillor Hart. Thank you, chair. Um, as you may know, I'm a ward councillor for this uh, area, uh, together with Rhys. Um, I must admit, when 
when you look at this building, it's a lovely building, and I think that um, I must disagree totally with the planning officers because I feel that the um, making it squared off and looking nice presents the building in a much better way. I think people have to learn to adapt these grade two listed buildings to be a, a livable and sensible way to live. And I think that the, um, uh, to use Councillor Auburn's words, hodgepodge of extensions that have gone on it over the past few year, decades, um, don't enhance the building at all. And in fact, um, by doing this one uh, new proposal, I think it'll make it a much nicer, um, usable building. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hart. Uh, Councillor Joe Bayford. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I do agree with um, the comments from C C Councillor Auburn and Councillor Hart. Um, my my uh, yeah, hodgepodge mishmash was what, what, what I was going to say. It does look a little bit of a mess. To be honest, I think the bay looks odd there. I love bay windows, but I don't think it, look, it, they, it looks good there. Um, and I think, to be honest, that the, the flat roof extension will only improve the aesthetics of the building. So um, I, I, I can't really support refusal of this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bayford. Uh, Councillor Moore, Paul Moore. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's all just been said by the previous councillors. I think uh, the present condition of the building is a mishmash um, and it doesn't look particularly nice. I think what the developer and the owners have, have proposed brings uniformity and blends the building into one. Um, my only uh, my only uh, question would be um, from the, the slides that um, <coughs> Mr Livingston showed, um, the new windows are single glazed and don't seem to blend in with what's in the building at the moment on the, the new bit that we were talking about and the existing. And by that, I mean the Georgian style windows with the beadings and, and to have those on those glazings would just blend it in and make it look more, uh, uni more uniformity. And I'm a great person for that. I like to see things matching. And I think that would just set that whole rear off a lot better, but I cannot agree with the planning officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, I don't see that there are any other speakers um, on this application. Uh, so, members, it's over to you. You've heard the recommendation is refusal. Once again, I'm going to have to call your names out. Um, if you're for refusal, please say so. If you're against or you're abstaining, please let me know. Um, uh, Councillor Coleman Cook. Four. Councillor Steve Alban. Against. Councillor Bayford. Against. Councillor Curry. Against. Councillor Garner. Four. Councillor Hart. Against. Councillor Keane. Against. Councillor Paul Moore. Against. Councillor Rezeski. Against. Councillor Scott. Against. Councillor Wright. Against. And I'm against that as well. So um, that motion has been lost. Um, so right in uh, Mr. Livingston, can we come back to you? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. So um, in terms of proposing a new motion um, to approve the scheme um, on the back of the vote, um, it uh, I just think it's important to, to sort of summarise um, that members, a number of members have mentioned about how the proposed development would actually, in their view, enhance the character of the, the listed building in terms of the, the, the what it would do to, to assist in sort of tidying up the rear of the property. So if a motion is put forward for approval, if, if the member that does so could simply just state that on the grounds that it would it would preserve and enhance the the character of the listed building thank you chair uh thank you ian um you've heard mr lewinson's advice there members um can i have a proposal for that please i'll oh, propose oh, that chair oh, oh go away yeah Oops. carry uh, on i'm lost who came first catch him more Thank you, Councillor. My youth got, got to the button quicker. Right. Councillor uh, Alwyn, uh, second? I'll second that, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bayford. Right. <laughs> have to go through, obviously, that once again, uh, members. Uh, you've heard the new uh, proposition to uh, 
the application. Let's go through your names again. Uh, Chairman, Cam sorry to interrupt, Chairman, but uh, Mr. Livingston would like the motion to be uh, read, Chair. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Just to, just to confirm then, I think just to make it absolutely clear for everyone watching that the motion that I was making clear that's been proposed and seconded is to approve the application uh, on the grounds that it only would preserve and enhance the character of the listed building. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, I do note Councillor Garner has put conditions. Does that cover your query there, Councillor Garner? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I've, I know we, we sort of had this discussion last time, but when, when a, an application comes before us for approval, there's a long list of conditions that have been put put on the application for us to approve. Now we've refused it and we're, we're approving it now, there aren't any conditions there, like the standard ones, or have the planning officers considered other conditions that they, if they were going to propose that we accept this, what would be the planning conditions they would want us to approve? That's my question. I don't know the answer. I'm just That's my question that maybe Mr Livingston can help with. I'll come back to you, Ian, but I believe we're going to touch on that in the next item. But um... Well, yes, I, I can I can pick up um, on that point. So when, um, under, under delegated authority, after a, a, an application is, is granted by members, um, there is delegated authority to put on safeguarding conditions, but indeed, as Councillor Garner points out, it is much better in, in committee meetings such as this that, that we can state that sort of firmly. So um, in terms of safeguarding conditions, the, there will be a standard time condition, and we would look to impose conditions which related to the, the previous approval, and that would include joinery details to be provided of the new timber windows, for example. Uh, as well as, as samples of materials to be provided. So those are the safeguarding conditions that we would put on this type of application, just to confirm for, for members' knowledge. Thank you for that, Ian. Um, if that answers Councillor Garner, Councillor Moore, does that answer your... Only in as much, Chair, that um, where we're saying we wish it to preserve and enhance the building, and we put a condition that the windows uh, match the style of the remainder of the building. Um, so that it blends in, um, because at the moment you've got Georgian, Georgian effect on the back and Georgian effect on the new build, and then you've got single glaze in the middle, uh, and I think that just breaks it up, and I don't think it looks right. Maybe we could put that as a condition. I don't know what the other members think of. Well, I'll come to Ian. Um... Um, so, members, if the motion is – obviously, the motion that's been put forward is to approve the development in front of members. So – that is the plans that members have been shown. So it wouldn't in allow for a change to the design of those plans that members have seen this evening. If that was wished and that by majority was put forward, that need, you know, an amended plan needs to be submitted, it would have to be deferred back to officers to seek that amended plan uh, and then potentially approved on that basis or brought back to members. So it's, it's about whether or not members are, are moving a motion to approve what they've seen or whether or not they're putting forward um, for additional and, and amended plans to be submitted about the design of the window itself on that side of elevation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Um, obviously, members, you've heard uh, the advice there. Um, we do have a proposal and a seconder uh, for the new application or what's been put forward. Uh, but now you've heard uh, Miss Livingston's thoughts, if you wish that to change, and it comes back to committee at another stage. Chairman, Could... come in, Chair, please. Yes, Councillor Alban. Uh, I think we should just, uh, there is an app, the application that we've looked at and we've seen it, we've seen what's there. We've all decided that we that uh, or not, not all, but it's been decided that uh, we we wish to go forward and approve this listed building consent, and I think we should stick with what is there, what was shown on the plans. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank thank you for that, Councillor Auburn. Um, Councillor May I reply, Councillor uh, Chair? Um, in light of what Council, uh, in light of what Mr. Limpton's just said, um, I retract what I said about the windows. It's what's in front of us, and I'm for what's in front of us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Moore. Uh, so moving on to the vote, uh, you've heard the new proposition. Um, 
those who are for, against, or abstaining, please let me know. Uh, uh, Councillor Coleman Cook? For. Councillor Auburn? For. Councillor Jill Bayford? For. Councillor Curry? For. Councillor Garner? For. Councillor Hart? For, Chair. Councillor Keane? For. Councillor pa Paul Moore? For, Chair. Councillor Ozeski? For. Councillor Scott? For, Chair. Councillor Wright? For, Chair. And I am as well. Uh, so that has been carried. Thank you very much, members. Right, moving on to item 4D, which is uh, again Garden Cotton Sherlock Minster. I'll ask Suki if you would read out a statement, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is um, from Mr. Errington, the agent. This presentation relates to the planning aspects of the development, incorporating design principles, visual impact and relationship to the conservation area. In terms of design, submissions circulated to members demonstrate that as far as the sash window in the rear elevation of the 1970s extension is concerned, there is no symmetry to the rear elevation other than the fact that the first floor rear dormer is centrally located and is flanked symmetrically by equally sized windows. However, the ground floor features do not relate to each other or the features above in terms of height, width, proportions or position, whilst the sash window to be removed is largely obscured from view by the existing rear outbuilding for which consents have been granted to enlarge and which will further obscure any view of the window. Similarly, there are no features on the listed building or its accretions which relate in design terms to the bay window which was consented in 1999, but which has been finished in new PVC and timber. The proposed kitchen addition will therefore be finished in feather edge timber cladding, which will not only be more in keeping with the character of the wider building, but will balance with and match the cladding already approved upon the extended outbuilding to the right hand side of the entrance hall. In this respect, the kitchen window will project no further outwards than the front elevation of the rear outbuilding as extended. The flat roof will form a minor continuation of the existing flat roof of the rear extension and the new window will reflect the proportions of the entrance hall door glazing, which has previously been approved by the council. Turning to the conservation area, it is important to note from the officer's report that local plan policy HE02 states within section 7 that in applications for extensions to buildings in conservation areas, the policy requires that the character scale and plan form of the original building are respected and the development is subordinate to it and does not dominate principal elevations. Members will have seen from the circulated photographic assessment and as has been confirmed by the applicants, independent heritage consultant, the areas of the building the subject to the council's concern relate to part of the extension constructed in the 1970s and a later addition approved by the council in 1999. Neither element is therefore part of the original building and nor are they directly attached to or directly associated with the main property. Indeed, the use of feather edge timber cladding will integrate more satisfactorily with the out rear outbuilding and provide a uniform and coherent built form beyond the 1970s extension. It is therefore considered that the proposals are acceptable in terms of design, appearance and materials, the work will be virtually invisible from any public point of view, which is only from a private access road and as such, the development is not contrary to the local plan, policies QD02 or HE02 or NPPF paragraphs 193 and 196. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Suki. Um, Councillor Pugh, as Wall Councillor, you wish to speak? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um... I'll try not to go over um, everything that I said again, but I suppose it may be easier for the committee if I do repeat a few points. Um, again, I called in this application because I feel that, um, that these changes will actually enhance the local area uh, rather than um, than well, essentially ruin it. Ruin it. Um, as many of the panel members will know, this is included within the Minster Conservation Area. But I think, as you've seen from the previous um, application um, 4C, uh, that actually 
the improvements that this will do to the property, I think, are quite substantial. And, you know, let's not forget that this is a, a family that have bought this property. Um, they want it to, to suit modern needs. And I think, as Councillor Auburn said in the previous um, application about um, about the, the listed nature of the building, you know, it's a bit of a hodgepodge as a building. You know, over the years, certain elements have been added. You know, there's a few little bits that kind of jut out. And I think that that adds more to the character of the building itself. Um, you know, and I think us as a council, I think it's our duty to, of course, um, ensure that things are in keeping with their surrounding area. But as I mentioned, particularly with the, the brick wall um, along uh, Church Road, Church Street, um, you know, and, and, and how very little of this can be seen um, of the public as they as they walk by. I think that I would urge this planning committee to grant uh, permission for this application. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Pugh. Um... I believe um, it's over to you again, Ian. Yes, thank you, Chair. I will just present my screen. Um, <clears throat> so just to um, just to give members the context of this application. So this is the application for planning permission for the development that, that has just been approved. So the consideration is different from the previous application for, for the, sorry, the listed building consent that's just been approved. Um, so this is considering the impact on the conservation area. Um, so just to show members where the conservation area is so here's the property in question so this is the property in question on a, a sort of rather more basic plan form but just showing that it's it's within the conservation area and the access that's been mentioned that runs down uh, the the rear of the property is also in the conservation area as well um so these are the images that we looked at earlier so the element is in this area here uh, these are the windows in the bay window that we've just talked about um and this is one of the viewpoints um so this is from that sort of access where you've got the cars parked here you know where you will you know you'll go get um views uh, of the extension that's being proposed um so the concern that officers have raised here is that views are possible from from the outside of the site and even with the boundary revisions that were part of the, the 2020 application uh, and you know, whilst this this extension is set against other elements, it is still considered that the expansion of the flat roof element across the rear of the property will affect the contribution that the building has within the conservation area. Um, and and on that basis, um, without the public benefits to outweigh the the harm, uh, it's is recommended for refusal on that basis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, I move that the officer's uh, recommendation is uh, for refusal could i have a seconder please uh, vice chairman i'll second that chair uh thank you council Coleman cook uh, members that we wish to discuss this councillor Auburn. yeah sorry to be first again chair um, <laughs> uh i i again i i, I don't see that this extension uh would detract from the conservation area chair um I, I think it's it's mainly shielded um the access road that runs down the side and the, the rear it, you know that it, it, it's not a highly used access it's not really seen by the general public as you walk by so there would be no in my opinion there would be no particular detriment to the conservation area so uh, as far as i'm concerned chair uh, I will be going against the officer's rec recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Auburn. Um, I can't see any other speakers. Right, uh, members, and I will say this, I know we're being live streamed on uh, the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, we do have a procedure, so uh, for members of the public who are watching and hear me go through the names of the members, uh, this is what we have to do. So um, it may sound to members sometimes a little bit too repetitious, but it has to be done. Um, I put this to you that uh, the recommendation is for refusal. Uh, once again, if you're voting for that or against or abstaining, please let me know. Uh, Councillor Coleman Cook. Against. Councillor Alban. Against. Councillor Bayford. Against. Councillor Curry. Against. Councillor Garner. For. Councillor Hart. Against, Chair. Councillor Keane. Against. Councillor Paulmore. Against, Chair. Councillor Rosesti. Against. 
Councillor Scott. Against, Chair. Councillor Wright. Against. Uh, myself, I'm against as well. Uh, so that motion has been lost. So therefore, we've got to come back. Um, can I come back to you, Ian? Yes, so same same principle as the last item, Chair, um, with this one. If a, a member is proposing a motion, um, you know, it's made clear from the previous debate carried over in terms of the visibility of this, that it's not considered to result in harm to the character of the, the conservation area. And, and that is sort of taken as the reason why any motion for approval would be put forward on, on those grounds. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Uh, members, uh, once again, you heard Mr Livingston's advice there. Um, I don't know whether you wish him to read that out again, but could I have, if not, could I have a proposal, please? I yeah, propose I'll propose that, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All yours. I know you always come first, Councillor Auburn, but, you know, uh, who did propose it? <laughs> Councillor Paul Moore. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, proposer, can I have a seconder, please? Thank you. Right, once again, uh, that dreaded list of names, uh, please. So you've heard Sorry, the... Who was the seconder there? Apologies, I missed that one. Uh, Councillor Auburn. Lovely, thank you. Right, once again, members, the, your dreaded list of names. Um, you've heard that motion put forward, which is now four. Um, please answer if you would. Keep uh, Councillor Coleman Cook. Four. Councillor Alban. Four. Councillor Jill Bayford. Four. Councillor Curry. Four. Councillor Garner. Against. Councillor Hart. Four, Chair. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Paul Moore. Four. Councillor Rizeski. Four. Councillor Scott. Four, Chair. Councillor Wright. Four, Chair. Councillor Lee. And I'm four as well. So that motion has been passed. Thank you very much, members, for that. Um, okay. Uh, Agenda item number 4E, which is Margate Football Ground, uh, Hartsdown Road, Margate. Um, I'm going to politely say this because we're being listened to, uh, but could Councillor Auburn please leave the meeting? I'm on my way, Chair. In the garden, stroll around in Cliftonville, have a look around, uh, Steve. Okay. Uh, the reason being for that, uh, if members are public listening, um, Councillor Alban has declared an interest in the Market Football Club application. I'll ask an officer, which I believe is Ian, once again, to, sorry, an officer who's got a public speaking statement, I'm sorry, uh, of an objection to this application. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is a statement objecting from Mr Arves. Whilst I am in principle in support of a hotel in the development of Margate Football Club, I do believe the current plan as it stands is in the wrong location and would be better served in the previously agreed planning consent FTH 110428 granted in December 2011. Due to the size, design and decor of the proposed hotel and stands, they will be visible all year from Hartsdown Park Tivoli Park and Tivoli Park Avenue, despite the planting of trees, which has taken place as these are not expected to mature for 30 years. They will be an intrusive addition to the open space currently enjoyed. I'm pleased to see that many of the concerns I originally raised have been noted and conditions attached to the planning consent should this application be granted. I do remain concerned over hotel residents' privacy when the grounds are in use, particularly when floodlights are used. However, I believe of greater concern now is the landscaping of Tivoli Park that is being undertaken and has resulted in the loss of playing fields within the park. It is by Thanet District Council's own admission that there is a shortage of playing fields in the district and the loss of any playing area should be of great concern to all. I note that it is the Council's plan to concentrate playing facilities at Jackie Baker's, that's in the District Plan 2020-2021. to 2021. 
This, however, has serious implications on the children of Margate, who are unable to travel to Ramsgate due to family circumstances, lack of income, and or no private transport, and by definition are likely to greatly benefit from sports facilities accessible by foot. I would also like to advise the Council that the playing pitch, which has now been lost, was in regular use by the youth connected to Margate Football Club in 2018, 2019, and during the period between lockdowns in 2020, when they carried the portable goalposts from the rear of the football stadium onto the park to play. So despite Margate Football Club actively wanting to lose this area, they are currently demonstrating there is a present need for this playing facility. The loss of a sizable area of Tivoli Park to enable the development of the hotel was not included in the plans posted online until October 2020, a considerable time after public comments were closed. The park belongs to and is paid for by the residents of Thanet, but they were not given an opportunity to express their views on effectively losing the park in an extension to Tivoli Woods. The tree planting was undertaken without any prior notice, and I note that the planning officer has stated that it did not require planning permission to do this. Just because you can, can, it doesn't mean you should. Residents deserve to be consulted on a major loss of parkland. There are better areas of the park which the trees could be planted, which do not result in the loss of playing fields. I would strongly recommend the committee refuse this application as it stands and request that the developer considers alternative options which do not impinge on the park or playing fields. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Suki. Um, and I'll ask the planning officer, which has, I believe is Ian. To That's give right, Chair. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> thank you. I will just present my screen. OK. Um, so the planning application for members is uh, an application for the erection of a 120-bed hotel which comprises of, of two stands uh, which incorporates uh, a hotel uh, associated uh, restaurant um, and, and other facilities uh, and then there's a, a club shop there's a um, then there's changing rooms um, with cafe at first floor on, on, on one of them and ancillary facilities for uh, club offices etc. Um, there is a significant amount of planning history on this particular site which members would have seen in the agenda um, and it includes extant planning permission from the permission that was originally granted in 2004 which was implemented and then subsequently has been varied in various ways uh, throughout the process but this this application in front of members is a, is a new application uh, for consideration the main issues are the principle of development uh, the impact on the character and appearance of the area highways loss of of playing pitch to playing field uh, impacts on the environment living conditions uh, and as well as the economic and social considerations of the application so this is the site outlined in red so you've got Hartsdown road here so um, this is sort of to the, the north, actually, on the right-hand side here. Uh, most of you will know Hartsdown Park here. Uh, so this is just an aerial view showing the football club at the moment, set inside the park. Um, this is a uh, an image just showing the football club, uh, but just to give you the reference point in terms of where it is located uh, in terms of uh, Margate Main Sands, uh, the train station, which is in this area here. You've got Tivoli Park Avenue here, and uh, Coffin House Corner is, is here. Uh, and then this is just another view just showing uh, the established tree lines that you've got in, in the park, as well as uh, a footpath route, which we're going to talk about, which runs through from Hartsdown to Tivoli Park Avenue. Uh, so this is a view from the front of the site. Um, looking, this is the between the car park and the car park. If I go just go back, the car park was one of the implemented elements of the 2004 uh, consent. So um, this has been obviously as part of the implementation of that scheme. 
Um, so you can see actually the footpath that I just mentioned running down between the football club and the car park. Uh, so that is a public right of way uh, as protected by, by KCC. Uh, this is a view looking from the park um, to what would, what is effectively the east of the site. So you can see a collection of buildings at the moment which are located adjacent to the pitch uh, with the car park behind the railings in the foreground. And this is a view looking back towards the road. So you can just hear, might be able to just see the, the signage for the, for the football club, uh, just showing some of the trees that are there as well as the relationship with the road. Uh, so that's those buildings on the, the eastern part of the football ground. So this is a view taken showing the corner of the site um, to the, the sort of fullest of the uh, eastern northern extent uh, with some of the trees that are, are currently present on the site. If I just click on, then I'll show you where we were looking at. We're looking at this area in the bottom right of the image here was where we were just looking at. You can actually see the single story structure that you could see with the graffiti on the previous image. So what we're just gonna do is we're gonna look at this northern uh, elevation uh, existing to show the, the the existing trees that are present along here. So this is the view along. You've got a se series of mature trees, but then you've also got uh, quite a bit of scrub below that. Uh, and then if you're walking all the way along here, you get to the uh, the, the five side pitches, um, sort of to the to the west of the football club, um, and then turning back. Uh, just shows you the other view of those um, you know, trees that are present along the boundary of the site. And you can see the railings just through here that run all the way along that delineates the actual football ground itself. Uh, so now we're just going to look at this area of land here, um, which is the, the bit of, of the pitch or the, the bit of the, the park to be lost by the proposal. Um, so this is the at the moment, the car park that's there. So part of the land to be uh, developed is, is in this part of the image here. So then moving back, you can see the full extent of the, the sort of square or rectangular section that forms part of the application site. Uh, mention has been made of, of these trees that have been planted. Um, so these trees have not been planted within the application site and they haven't been planted as part of the application. Uh, this has been done separately, um, um, I believe, in agreement between the football club and, and TDC Estates um, to be able to plant these trees. So they don't form part of the application itself. Uh, and so this is a view from behind those trees, but showing that section of land where the proposed car park would be developed. And this is just another view further back again, showing the, the bank of trees, the other side of which is the car park and the area that's proposed to be developed. So this is an image from the other revisions to the 20, uh, to, sorry, 2004 application that was approved. Um, and that 2004 application uh, was approved for an 80 bed hotel with new stands to the north and the east with uh, various sort of functions, including uh, leisure facilities, fitness club, cafe and ancillary facilities linked to the hotel. So it's a similar proposal to what's been put forward, but with certain key elements changed. Um, one of those elements that's that's changed is that this is the car park that was approved uh, in the one of the revisions in, in 2012. Um, you will see that um, this proposes for the the car park to extend through that open space that we were just looking at and those the the what's classed as public open space um and also extending actually further out than the the northern boundary of the football club um with with more parking and it's also it's 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 slightly sort of slightly wider as well than what's what you'll see is being proposed at the moment um the permissions are extant, uh, so they can be continued and implemented at any time. And we'll come on to why that's relevant as when we're talking about the loss of playing pitches. Um, these are elevations from two separate applications. The top one is an elevation from the 2011 application, which has already been rent, uh, referenced. And this is the east elevation of what has been approved for, uh, for an 80 bed hotel um, as part of 
that, that approval again that is part of an extant permission and then this is showing on the bottom of the image is showing the north stand from outside the site uh, looking in um, so with you know the trees effectively would be in front of this uh, um, uh, you know elevation of the north stand at the bottom here um, and again that is part of the extant permissions on the site so in terms of the proposal um, as mentioned 120 bed hotel which is located in the eastern stand here uh, the eastern stand would also um, have seated accommodation well seated um, spectator areas of, of about 650 seats um, the northern stand which primarily is um, is studio space for use um, including use of the community but also has changing facilities for the football club uh, on the first floor has a cafe but also has um, terrace capacity of uh, I think it's 1,300 terrace capacity for seating so it does include an increase in the seated or, or standing accommodation for for the football ground the south and uh, so the south and west parts of the football club are remaining as as currently so there's no proposal in front of members at this point for development of those um, those sections uh, the car park as proposed is at the bottom of the image here um, what's being proposed here is 104 car parking spaces for the hotel and the ancillary facilities with a coach parking turning area uh, at the this sort of um, what's the northeast of the site um, so I'm just going to go through the elevations of the proposed eastern stand um, these elevations are having to be split into two because of the the size of them and so that members can actually see them um, but there are some perspectives that we'll look at so this is if you've just entered the car park and you are looking to the left this is the the closest to the road element of the the building so this is the the elevation that fronts the car park um, so it's a, a four-story building at its highest point but three-story in the majority um, the materials that proposed are aluminium windows with cladding panels in in blue to match the, the colors of the football club um, with a sort of brise soleil feature um, to try and break up the elevation here as well as brickwork uh, at ground floor and in the central four-story element um, here um, and just looking over you can see that then the four-story element continues on with another one of the um, the sort of solar shading elements um, to be white before it then drops down uh, to a single story when then it sort of turns the corner into what becomes then the, the north stand of the building. So these are the elevations that front the car park. Um, this is the back of the elevation we just saw. Obviously you can see uh, the, the seating arrangements for the football ground itself. Uh, and then this is the other side. So you can see that central four story brick element in, in this part of the screen here. Uh, and then this is the roadside, um, I suppose, facing the south of the site. So facing Hartsdown Road, um, uh, the elevation that you get, you can see they've added in the, the, the Brice Soleil features here. And then the other elevation, so this is facing the parks. This is to the north uh, of the site. So this is a perspective view that's been provided by the applicant. So it's, it's a representation, um, but it's useful to just see the context of, of the different articulations in built form that are being proposed. So it's not a flat frontage all the way along the full extent of this building. It does um, protrude in and out uh, with canopies, uh, depending on where um, the entrances are and, and where the different building elements are situated. Uh, and there's another view there so you can actually see the main entrance point here and, and the way that the building is set in at different points uh, to break up the mass of what's been proposed. Um, so just going through the floor plans of this eastern section of the building. So um, this element here, which is the ground floor uh, closest to the road, is the restaurant in association with the hotel. You can see on the right hand side here, uh, this is the lobby area of the hotel. And if I just click on to the next part, you can see, sorry about the splitting up the slides, um, which is the, for the plans. You can see this sort of breakfast area for the hotel as well, and some of the back room um, parts of the hotel in this area here. Um, this uh, section of the building is for club offices, for the football club, with a club shop, um, which is located here. 
then moving through the elevations as mentioned it's a 120 bed hotel so you've got rooms on the first floor in this section and also the first floor on the second section so you see the relationship with the car park here with then the second floor as well with a number of bedrooms and then this section here again showing the bedrooms that located on the second floor and then the third floor obviously has that section in the center which is primarily for um you know it's got some additional bedrooms that are here but also has some plant equipment and, and maintenance rooms uh, and then this is the roof plan what's obviously been proposed here is is for solar panels on the roof as well and this is just showing the roof forms and how they connect so moving on to the the proposed north stand so as mentioned this includes a um, you know, cafe at, at, at first floor, but with also changing facilities. Um, so this top set, top view is the actual view from the, the football pitch. Uh, so this is showing, you can see the terraced areas on the ground floor here uh, with the windows serving the cafe at, at um, first floor. And then uh, the image at the bottom is showing the view that um, would be the elevation which would face towards the, the park. And these are the side elevations of that part of the building. <clears throat> and then the floor plans, as mentioned, the studio space here on the ground floor with changing facilities and then the, the cafe uh, in this location on the first floor here. And this is just the roof plan. Um, so to just pick up points about landscaping. so. This is the landscaping plan that was submitted. Um, just to outline, just to pick up one of the points that's been raised in the public speaking, the um, details of the actual uh, loss of the playing pitches. So the site plan that we've seen earlier was part of the public consultation. So um, no addition has been made during the course of the application or no additional loss of playing pitches has been it, it sort of introduced through the process. Uh, in this instance so consultation has occurred on the full extent of the car park uh, which obviously as we've seen from the images uh, extends over part of the current um, playing fields that are present or, or protected a public open space so as mentioned this tree planting is is shown to be outside the site so whilst it may be proposed um, potentially separate to this planning application it's not forming part of the application in front of members um, the extent of the site as mentioned goes over this area here um so this area has been as mentioned part of extent permissions um and so the report does talk about the fact that technically this um that area um th that's currently grassed is is under policy gi05 um and and it doesn't constitute one of the sort of caveats of that policy for protection of public open space however um, the weight to be given to that public open space is put forward by officers to be limited. And there's a very specific reason for that. And that is those extant permissions, because this land is no longer in the ownership of the district council. It's under the ownership of, of Margate Football Club. And it's always been envisioned since 2004 that that land, that playing pitch would be lost for the proposal for the car park throughout the years. Um, and therefore, whilst there is actually by this proposal, there is a loss. Um, significant weight is provided to the extant permissions on the site. Now, this has been relayed to Sport England, and you will see from the correspondence that we've received during the application that there is still an objection to the application from Sports England. What this means is, if members were to go with the officer recommendation uh, this evening to um, defer and delegate for approval, is that the local authority will be required to consult with the Secretary of State because of the objection from Sports England uh, and to understand whether or not the Secretary of State wishes to call the application in uh, for consideration. Um, and, or, and if they don't, then we would be able to issue the decision for approval. Uh, but if they do, then obviously they would take the authority to determine the application. So moving through the perspectives of the scheme and, and just outlining the considerations, the impact on the character of the area. Um, these are uh, images that have again been provided by the applicant, um, but um, we have looked at them in terms of the comparison between the approved scheme, which is outlined in, in red, and the proposed scheme, um, which is put forward to members this evening. Um, so you'll see in, in 
that the extent of the building does not exceed what's been proposed and approved in the previous consents. It's simply that the internal arrangement has changed to allow an increase from a 80 bed hotel to a 120 bed hotel. Uh, so this is a perspective that's been provided by the applicant from, from Tivoli Park Avenue. Um, it is considered that, you know, the building obviously would be an increase, um, quite a significant increase on the fact that there is, is nothing on the site at the moment. But again, members should take into account the fact that uh, there is a obviously an approved consent for a four storey building on this site. Uh, and also in, in officer's view, the scale of the building is not uh, would not dominate the open space, but would um, you know, due to the openness, it wouldn't seem excessive or, or out of scale in, in officer's view. Um, there is another um, image here, which just shows directly that that eastern elevation uh, of the proposal. Um, to pick up the points um, that the report cover, um, transportation is one of the key issues that's been looked at here. And it's had quite a lot of discussion between KCC Highways, uh, the applicant and, and the council. Um, you know, the site is considered to be in a sustainable location. It's within 800 metres of two uh, bus stops, 15 minute walk of the station. Um, provisions have been made for 105 spaces serving the hotel and the facilities. Um, a transport assessment has been submitted and, and has been uh, looked at by KCC Highways, uh, who have raised no objections uh, to the amount of parking provision that's been provided. Um, the report also details about um, the uh, public rights of way. So um, the public right of way that runs through the site, which is um, TMX uh, 13 that you can see on the image in front of you, that's um, proposed as part of this scheme to be resurfaced. Uh, and there's also a financial contribution, which was requested by KCC for upgrading uh, the footpaths in the vicinity of the site, but linked obviously to anyone using All Saints Avenue or, or further to the west to access the site. Um, that contribution has already been secured by a planning obligation which has been submitted. Um, there's also a planning obligation for this type of development, which is hotel development, for uh, towards the, the SAMs, so the, the, the contribution towards mitigation of the special protection area. Um, that's calculated on a reduced rate from normal residential accommodation to take into account likely winter occupancy, dropping down number of visitors. Um, and that's been agreed with Natural England as per our, our standing advice. So there is the mitigation has been secured by planning obligation for for that part of the of the, the the permission or, or proposal. Um, in terms of the impact on living conditions, um, it's considered that the buildings themselves are significantly far away from 102 Hartsdown Road, as well as obviously a very significant distance from from Tivoli <laughs> Park Avenue. Uh, proposals would be required to be submitted to the local council for. Um, lighting uh, and that would cover issues to do with biodiversity, security and potentially light pollution as well because obviously it is quite an exposed elevation so it is really important that the lighting strategy that's provided makes sure it's paying reference to both protected species but also the potential spillage that you could get from something like this. Um, there's also um, various conditions with regards to archaeology, a lot of these conditions have been looked at on previous consents as well uh, and they're detailed in the officer report. Um, overall, in terms of the considerations, uh, it's the view of officers that the proposal would result in, in demonstrable tourism and community benefits as well from both the new hotel, but also the improvements to the football club, as well as, as employment from the um, hotel that would be created from the proposal. Uh, the design has been considered to be acceptable. Um, and therefore, whilst there is uh, a, a, you know, the development would represent a departure from policy uh, GI05 um, as involving the loss of public open space on, on, a, on a technical basis, limited weight is, is provided to that loss on the basis of the um, weight to be given to the extant permissions. Uh, and therefore the application is recommended um, to be deferred and delegated for approval, subject to the safeguarding conditions uh, and subject to consultation with the Secretary of State to understand whether or not they want to call in the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ian. Very impressive. Um, I move that the officer's recommendation, uh, as you've heard, is to defer and delegate. Could the uh, Vice Chair please second? I'll second that, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Coleman Cook. Uh, Councillor Joel Payford. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Well, the football club has provided entertainment and interest to local people and visitors for many, many years. Um, it's inevitable that over time, um, improvements, um, extensions will need to be made in order to um, accommodate current demands. It appears to me that a lot of trouble has been taken here to ensure that, um, uh, although, although it cannot be denied that it's, it's a large um, development, it, um, it maintains a lot of the, 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 the uh, football pitches, the, the, the playing fields that are already there. It's a, a fair distance from the, um, the local building, the, the nearest buildings. Um, with the taking into account the extant permissions and what seems to me very careful planning um, for something that I think would be a great community benefit, I think I'd like to support this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bayford. Councillor Garner. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I have. Um, I do have a few concerns about about this um, proposal. Um, the first one, it wasn't mentioned in the report, but I see uh, not only is it Sports England who are objecting to this, but Kent Police have raised an objection, raising a number of issues, um, which I think ought to be addressed um, to minimise the opportunity for crime, fear of crime and antisocial behaviour. Um, so that, that was a mention. So I would like to hear a bit more about that if possible. But the loss of open space is the concern to me. Um, Sport England, as you say, have objected, and I, I can understand why they've objected. It seems there's, there's been a bit of not very joined up thinking um, over the last few months or years where we've known the land's going to be lost, the, the playing fields are going to be lost as part of this development. But at the same time, We've planted a, a number of trees have been planted on other um, playing field that, that has resulted in more loss than there should have been. And obviously, I'm, I'm the last person here who's going to object to planting of trees, but they need to be planted, obviously, in the right place. Um, another concern that I have relates to um, access and the, the roads. Um, obviously, I'm that we know that coming down the coming down the road soon in the next few months, there's going to be a proposed development opposite this, um, the, the football ground in the the site off of Shottenden Road for I believe 250 houses, which is obviously going to add to the weight of traffic in the surrounding area. Um, so it's a shame these can't all be thought of in a in a joined up way. Um, I'd just like to finish with a with a question, really. I, I didn't I didn't fully understand, and I, I hope maybe Miss Simmonson can explain the actual ownership of the land that is being built on, because obviously there's it. Well, not obviously, but it looks like land has been acquired over the years to extend the size of this site, and I just uh, like to understand better where that's come from. And, and who owns all of the land that's being built on now. And so it's a couple of things there, but hopefully you can help. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Garner, Ian, um, I, think I, I, I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you... Um... Thank, you thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll come back on, 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 on the various points um, that, that, that have been raised. So um, just to pick up um, the f one, one of the points about um, access to the site, if I start with that one. So the, the proposal would utilise the existing access um, to the site, and it has been in the transport assessment, there is modelling showing um, vehicles entering and exiting that um, access, uh, including coaches um, and also delivery vehicles, which has been looked at on a safety basis by, by KCC. Um, I think it, an important point about the relationship with um, other applications that are in with the council at the moment um, is obviously because it's the existing access that's there um, you know that is obviously going to be part of any arrangement that's put forward on any subsequent application for other sites that obviously will take into account visibility of any new accesses in relation to the existing accesses so there is some uh, you know there will be some joined up thinking with there and in terms of 
uh, traffic capacity, this scheme is considered by highways to be within the capacity of the highway network. Uh, subsequent applications will obviously have to prove uh, in the same way that their development would also be within the capacity of the highways network or whether or not indeed other, other network capability will be required in terms of road links, etc. Um, in terms of the police, they have raised um, some concerns with regards to the scheme. Um, it has been considered that the scheme does have uh, a sort of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a balance because in regards of what they're actually proposing here, uh, there would clearly be improvements to the security, for example, with regards to the footpath that runs through the site, because at the moment that footpath can be utilised across the park without much surveillance, whereas obviously if you have a hotel and that sort of development and the surface is redone with lighting, etc., that that would obviously improve security to some extent. Um, detailed concerns um, have, you know, can be addressed through informatives because there are sometimes often issues that that aren't dealt with by planning conditions because they are are rather more about the management of the premises in this instance of the hotel. Uh, and obviously, um, there is something that we would always encourage applicants uh, subsequent to approval to contact Kent Police about certain security arrangements and um, issues to do with with security. Um, to pick up the point with regards to ownership. Um, the the previous the 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 site previously was under the freehold ownership of Thanos Council um, that um, it's, it was the site outlined in red um, and that's but that's no longer the case it's now owned by the football club so whilst on the ground when we were looking at the squares the square of of open space uh, that open space is no longer under the ownership of the the council it was part of the uh, overall site that was sold um, a couple of years ago now um, to uh, so the freehold was sold off so which is why in terms of the loss of playing pitches and I take your point with regards to the the tree planting the tree planting though has as I mentioned is has been dealt with by the TUC estates team um, on the basis of looking at the whole of the park uh, to work out you know where pitches could be um, but in terms of what's lost in this instance, it is land that has already been, um, you know, it, it's already been approved for development. And that which is why we've put forward, obviously, the view that we have that actually it's 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 been known that this this particular parcel of land would be lost for 16 years. And actually, even further than that, because there's a 2002 application, which was for I think it was a 3000 state uh, seat to stadium. Um, which would again have resulted in a similar sort of loss. So um, it, it hasn't been delineated on the ground, but that's why we've considered that the loss in this instance would be acceptable. Uh, thank you for that, Ian. Um, no, I, I have, if I may, uh, I know we have other speakers. Uh, the police are coming in on quite a few of our applications now, which um, I say, obviously, they have the right to, as they do with licensing and so on, but I think some of their um possible comments um just to be looked at uh uh councillor Rzeski. thank you chair um looking at the design uh, of the project it looks uh, quite suitable for the area i don't see any problem in that uh, i think it actually will be a great investment for margate it will bring jobs um and uh, overall uh, i'm for it so uh, yes i will be supporting this application thank you Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Curry. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree with um, Councillor Rizeki. I believe um, uh, this development would be a real boost to the area um, and the club, obviously. Um, however, with regard to the loss of any open space or playing field, um, I wonder if Ian could um, tell us if any financial contributions towards um, existing community playing fields have, um, have, have been included. I know Sport England did mention this as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Ian, can you? Um... Uh, yeah, so the, there isn't, hasn't been um, anything secured through this planning application. And again, this is about um, when a planning obligation is is reasonable um, in, and also necessary to make the development acceptable. And, and the important point here is about the what is considered by officers to be a quite realistic fallback, which is that the playing pitch, you know, the car park could be extended tomorrow under the previous consent and the playing pitch would be lost. And that has to carry weight in the determination of, of this application. 
uh, you know, I, I don't I don't have in front of me any any of the potential arrangements that the Margate Football Club do in terms of community and usage of, of pitches. Um, I'd imagine there is something there. But in terms of the consideration of whether or not we should seek a contribution towards other community facilities as a result of this development, it's not considered that that actually would make the development acceptable uh, that that obligation would be necessary to make the development acceptable given the fallback position and ability over the previous um 14 years to to basically um you know lose that section of of the park through the fact that permission has already been granted okay thanks ian uh, thank you ian um uh, i think as I, I touched on uh, on monday when i had a meeting with mr livingston um having a look up at Tivoli Wreckers. I think we've always known it. Uh, obviously, it was the Isle of Thanet Tree Initiative that had put these trees, uh, which, you know, in a few years' time are, are going to look good. But there is still room for, shall we say, the port portable football pitch uh, that's been mentioned there where, the you know, in the, the letter that was read out, uh, the goals used to be brought out, but there is room. Um, possibly they might have to move just a little bit, but there is room up there. So, okay, members, um, I can't see any other <coughs> members wish to speak. Um, so I'm going to put this to you once again. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. And as you've heard, that is to uh, defer approval for approval, where uh, defer and delegate. Um, I'm going to call out your names uh, once again. Um, it's like being at school. Uh, Councillor Coleman Cook. Four. Councillor Auburn's not here. He should be out walking Cliftonville. Uh, Councillor Bayford. Four. Councillor Murray. Four. Councillor Garner. Against. Councillor Hart. Four, Chair. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Paul Moore. Four, Chair. Councillor Zeski, four. Councillor Scott, four chair. Councillor Wright. Having sat, sat through this application a long time ago and seen it refused, it's about time. It's it's a long time coming for the. I am supporting the application. Thank you, Councillor Wright. I go along with that as well. It's, uh, so that is uh, carried. Uh, thank you very much, James, for doing that. Thank you, members. Um, uh, let's see, and hopefully it all goes ahead. Uh, okay, um, moving on now to um, the item for F8 Percy Avenue, and I believe uh, Mr. Alden could have joined us if he's been notified. I think Katie's just giving him a call now. Thank you, James. I'll just wait to. Get Councillor Alban back in. If Councillor Alban is there, he is. Thank you, Councillor Alban. No doubt you walk the cliff tops. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, didn't write him for F8 Percy Avenue. I will ask Suki once again to read out a statement from the public, please. Thank you, Chair. This is a statement in favour for Mr Hume, who is the agent. Good evening, members. My name is Alistair Hume of Hume Planning Consultancy, and I am speaking in support of this application at 8 Percy Avenue. The proposals are for the redevelopment of a vacant storage premises to create five apartments, comprising a mixture of two and three bed units. I believe it is generally accepted that the current building, which is to be converted and extended, is of a poor design and makes no positive contribution to the street scene. The proposal, I believe, will greatly improve the look of the building, whilst making more efficient use of a brownfield site within the settlement confines, where development is both supported and encouraged by local and national planning policy. It is also relevant that following a reduction in scale and depth of the extensions, which were negotiated during the course of the application by the case officer, the living conditions of adjoining occupiers will also be safeguarded acceptably. Throughout the course of this application, the applicant has worked with the case officer to take account of their feedback and the comments of neighbours, which has resulted in significant amendments to the proposals, including a reduction in the number of dwellings proposed from six to five units, 
a reduction in the overall massing and extent of the proposed roof space, the inclusion of outdoor amenity space for the units, and the provision of a five car parking spaces, one per unit. Following the above amendments, KCC Highways and Environmental Health have both confirmed that they raised no objections to the scheme and Broadstairs Town Council have not raised objection to the application in their latest responses. Furthermore, there were no neighbour comments received on the latest round of amended plans. In summary, the proposal will replace the existing unattractive building and will improve the appearance of the street scene. The principle of development is supported by the development plan and NPPF. The proposal is supported by the case officer and no objections have been raised by the statutory consultees and the development will be constructed to a high standard of energy and water efficiency to be secured by conditions 12 and 13 and will also introduce landscaping at the site. On this basis, it is respectfully requested that members grant permission for this application in line with the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Suki. Um, I will ask uh, Councillor Bob Bayfoot uh, to speak as ward councillor. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, evening, members. Um, <coughs> yes, as was stated, uh, the original application was for six flats. There was widespread objection to that proposal, and it was subsequently reduced to five flats. But I believe that even with this concession, it's still a great overdevelopment of the site, and there is still local feeling against it. Um, on site presently, as has been said, is a single story flat roofed building that is actually being replaced by a very large three story building of what I think is poor design. To me, it looks as though the main, in fact, maybe the only driver here is to maximise the return from the development and little consideration has been taken for its position in the, the neighbourhood. Um, I believe the site is suitable for something considerably smaller which could be more attractive and might actually enhance the street scene. There's little or no landscaping. There is parking provision for just five vehicles, which I think is inadequate. There could be two vehicles per flat and there will be visitors. Um, this will lead to parking on the road near a junction, which is very congested on busy summer days. Um, I also believe that there is some issue about the validity of the five parking space is shown on the plan so if it is for approval I hope officers will actually check that out because there's been some suggestion that um, you know the uh, the applicant can't provide those or isn't in a position to, to guarantee those five spaces um, members uh, if you share my concerns I hope you will refuse this application thank you uh, thank you councillor Bayford um, uh, I speak I would pass over to Ian I believe once again no, it's, it's Annabelle, Chair. I beg your pardon, Ian. Um, go to Annabelle for her report, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share the screen. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, hopefully members can now see the screen. We can. Uh, yeah, we have the application site outlined in red. Um, Percy Avenue to the left hand side of the slide and we have a series of some aerial photographs that may help inform members about the site and its relationship with surrounding development. So this is the site here, this uh, rectangular site. We have Greyfriars um, Court to the bottom of the slide here. Um, this is looking from King's, sorry, from George Hill Road. So this is Kingsgate, sorry, Greyfriars Court, which is a block of flats. The application site here, and this is an access road with some garages and various um, parking spaces there. This is looking from Kingsgate Avenue. So the application site is here. There are houses along Kingsgate Avenue, and this again is Greyfriars. Uh, court. Um, this is looking up at the site from Percy Avenue. So this is numbers 12 and 10 um, Percy Avenue and number 8 is behind it here and that's the access road we've looked at. And this is actually um, looking at the site. This is Percy Avenue here, numbers 12 and 10 and number 8 here. And again, this is Greyfriars Court. 
So just looking at some actual photographs of the site, this is the um, number eight Percy Avenue. And this is numbers 10 and 12 Percy Avenue. Um, this is number 10 and the edge of number 12 on the left hand side of the slide. And this is number eight, and it can be seen that it projects some distance in front of number 10. Um, this is um, the access road here, and this is actually Greyfriars Court again, and you can see it's a lot, well, a three-story block of flats. This is the side of number eight, and this is the access road where some car parking will be provided to serve the flats, and you can see it some existing car parking there and some garages as you go further down this is again going further down to on the access road so as you can say there were garages this is actually the access to the flat uh, on top of number 10 so this is the access to number 10 a which is the flat above it this is number 10A and number 12 to the right hand side and this bit flat roof you can see on the left hand side is the application site. But this is the existing block plan so has been seen this is the application site it projects further forward than number 10 and number 12. This is Greyfriars Court and that's the access road that we've seen the photographs of. Um, this is the proposed block plan. As has been mentioned by the statement we've just heard, there are now five um, dwellings or flats proposed within the application. There are two areas of landscaping proposed, one to the front here and one to the rear. And the blue dotted areas are the five parking spaces that have been referred to. So there are one at the front, one at the rear and three within the access road. So this is the front elevation as existing, and you can see number 10 there as well. This is the proposed extension. Um, so essentially the bill, sorry, the front proposed front elevation, not extension. So you can see that it is in fact um, a two-story development with some rooms within the roof. So essentially two and a half story rather than the three that has potentially been referred to. And you can see on the um, plan here and um, some dotted lines in blue, and that's an approval, a previous approval on the site um, that was granted in 2005. So there is planning history of um, approvals here already. So this is the rear elevation, and that case we looked at going up to the flat at number on the top of number 10. And again, this is the proposed rear elevation and you can again see the dotted line of the pre previous approval. Um, these are the side elevations as existing and this is a proposed side elevation. And this is south, the other side, the south elevation as existing and this is a proposed elevation. Um, and as you can see, there was the open space areas that have been proposed, each flat would either have an area of open space at ground level or be served by terraces um, at various levels. So each flat would have some area of open space. So this is the existing ground floor layout and as has been mentioned, the building is currently um, actually unoccupied and vacant. So this is the proposed ground floor. So this is the area of private amenity space that would serve actually flat one and it would have a car parking space here and would have its own entrance here. There were a further two flats um, located on the ground floor and a communal entrance that would serve all, all the other four flats that are in uh, the development. Again, there is a parking space to the rear here and an area of private amenity space. This is the first floor so you have a further two flats here, again, with roof terraces that we've seen. And you can see again here how much further it projects from forward of number 10. And again, this is the, essentially, it's, it's referred to as second floor 
on the drawing, but it essentially is the bit we've seen where the rooms would be set within the roof. And these um, rooms that you can see here actually are, are part of the flats on the first floor. So they are essentially masonette flats, these two. So essentially, to summarise, um, the proposal would bring would create five units of residential accommodation and would bring an empty unit back into use and that is supported by um, the council's planning policies there are no issues um, from officers point of view with the standard of pro proposed accommodation it meets the technic national technical standards and would provide light and ventilation um, and provide a good standard of accommodation for future occupiers there is no impact on neighbour amenity or highway safety or parking. Um, a contribution is required, as with all residential development, for uh, the SAM to mitigate against additional rec recreational pressure on the SPA. Um, and that would be secured um, via a unilateral undertaking. So the recommendation to members is to defer and delegate for receipt of that uh, undertaking. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Annabelle. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. Could the vice chair please second? I'll second that, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, members, um, right, uh, Councillor Keane. No, just a quick question, thank you. Um, and that is, is there any bike storage? Annabelle, can you? Y yes, Chair, we can come back on that. Yes, there is. There's a communal bike store as you go in to the sort of main entrance for that serves the four flats. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jill Bayford. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a Kingsgate resident, um, I, I also believe that the development is still too big. Um, I'm pleased it's come down from six units, but I think it needs to come down further. It would be far preferable to see something smaller with some landscaping and a little bit of space. Um, with Greyfires Court at the top of the road, I think that there's a huge amount of bulk at the top, top of Percy Avenue, which is, is a a very congested area anyway um it's very very difficult for parking and i think this is going to cause all kinds of problems if it goes through um i, I personally cannot support this application i would i prefer to see something much smaller thank you chair uh thank you councillor bayford councillor wright thank you chairman um i must admit i agree, agree with jill um i will say i have my heart is in percy avenue i spent a lot of my childhood there um but i i just think it looks like it just does not look right it just it's overbearing on on the on the property next door it, it just doesn't fit in thank you i won't be supporting this application i'm afraid okay thank you councillor wright um I do not see any other members uh, wish to speak. Um, so I'm going to put this to you members. Uh, the recommendation, as you've heard, is uh, for approval and defer and delegate. Um, once again, if I can go through your names, please. Um, you know how it works. Uh, Councillor Coleman Cook. Again, Councillor. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Cole, against Councillor Alderman. Sorry, I'm sorry, Chair, I was against, yes. Thank you, Councillor Coleman Cook. Councillor Alderman? Against. Councillor Jill Bayford? Against. Councillor Curry? Against. Councillor Garner? He's, he has uh, left the meeting. Um, Councillor Hart? For... Councillor Keane? Against. Councillor Paulmore? Against. Councillor Rozeski? Abstain. Councillor Scott? Abstain, Chair. Councillor Wright? Against. And I'm going to abstain on this one. Um, I'm looking for James. That has been lost. 
Right. So therefore, I come back to Ian or Annabelle. I'll, I'll come back if that's okay, Chair. Yes, thank you, Ian. Um, so um, we've heard from from Councillor Bay and Councillor Wright from the committee with regards to, to um, concerns about the the scale of the development and the fact that. Uh, in the view that the development doesn't fit in with the character of the, the area, um, primarily due to the actual location of the development itself and its relationship with the buildings surrounding it. So um, in terms of proposing a motion uh, for um, refusal of the application, uh, I can summarise some of the comments that that have been made then on that basis um, and it's that basically by virtue of the design and scale of the proposal uh, that it would result in um, a, a, a obtrusive and incongruous form of development uh, unrelated to its setting um, which on the basis uh, that's been put forward um, would result in significant harm to the character and appearance of the area. Uh, the policy that's relevant in this instance is the standard policy, which is a QDO2, which looks at design, which members will be familiar with. Um, so that would be um, that would be my recommendation if members were wanting to, um, you know, were looking to refuse the application and, and wanted to propose a motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Um you've heard Ian's comments there um any more debate on that or, or go straight to yourselves no nope. um Ian would you like to read out well well it would need it would need someone to propose the motion for that refusal so yep. I, I can give the advice but obviously it would need a member to that's, to that's, fine. that's fine. fine could I have a proposal please Chairman, I'll propose I'll propose exactly what Mr. Livingston has just said. I thought you might, Councillor Alban. Could I have a second? Chairman, I'll second that. Uh, Councillor Moore. Um, that's Paul Moore, of course. Right, once again, I do have to go through these names, as you're aware. Um, you've heard what's been said. Um, if you're for uh, what's been said or against or abstaining. Uh, Councillor Coleman-Cook. For, Chair. Councillor Alban? Four. Councillor Jill Bayford? Four. Councillor Curry? Four. Councillor Hart? Councillor Hart? I'm there, sorry, Ch trouble with me buttons. Four, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Keane? Four. Councillor Paul Moore? Four, Chair. Uh, Councillor Rozeski? Yeah, four, Chair. Councillor Scott. Four, Chair. Councillor Wright. Four, Chair. And I am four as well. So that has been carried. So therefore, we need um, a new motion put forward or. No, 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 that's, that's, that's confirmed the refusal. Oh, that, Chair. that is confirmed. You're happy with the wording. Thank you for that, members. Um, Okay, that concludes um, public speaking for this meeting. I will call upon the clerk to read out the remaining planning application. If a member wishes to reserve the application, will they please call out as he reads? I will ask uh, James, please. Thank you, Chair. So the last item is um, agenda item 4B, Chris Park in Chris Park Place, Birchington. Now, does anybody does anybody wish to speak? No. Nope. Okay. On that case, I would like uh, um, a proposal, please, to move that the application that be determined in accordance with the officer's recommendation. Could the vice chair please second? I'll second that, chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Coleman. Put uh, put. I'll uh, get your name right. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Unless anybody uh, objects to that proposal, I will take it that it is agreed. Yep, thank you very much. Right, the last item on tonight's um, meeting, I'll call upon Mr Livingston to introduce this report, please, Ian. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I will just um, quickly present my screen. Sorry, scanning down to the item. There we go. Um, so this is an agenda item. Um, it's previously been considered by members. Um, it's an application at uh, St. Helens Poplar Road Broadstairs. Uh, it was before members December 2019, uh, January 2020. Um, I suppose the before times. Uh, for changing use of the store and and, and flat. Um, it came back and forth because there was some discussion about um, the relationship between the car parking here and the insertion of a window that you may recall here for the conversion of this storeroom at the moment that's in this area in the building to a studio flat. Members resolved to grant the application uh, for approval um, subject to the receipt of a unilateral undertaking securing the SAMS contribution. Um, and that caveat is always put on that it occurs within six months. Well, we didn't receive the unilateral undertaking within six months, and we've only received that in, in February this year. Uh, and so therefore, we've reported it back to members, uh, which is the requirement to um, to reaffirm the approval, uh, that's the recommendation for officers because now that the issue has been resolved with regards to the unilateral undertaking, uh, there will be no changes to the proposal. Um, and as the report outlines, it was originally considered against the draft local plan policies. And so there isn't any change, even though the local plan was adopted in July last year, it hasn't changed anything substantively to come to a different determination to approve subject to the safeguarding conditions outlined uh, it uh, annex one of the report and that's the recommendation to members thank you chair uh thank you and i think uh, those who are on the committee will remember um us speaking about this on a couple of occasions um i move the officers recommendation is adopted could the vice chair please second i'll second that chair uh now members do you wish to debate this I have no names on my screen, um, so I will have to ask you again uh, to agree or against or abstain for the last time tonight. Uh, so I'll start with Councillor Coleman Cook. Four, Chair. Councillor Corbyn. Four. Councillor Bayford. Four. Councillor Curry. Four. Councillor Hart. Four, Chair. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Paul Moore. Four, Chair. Councillor Roseski. Four. Councillor Scott. Four, Chair. Councillor Wright. Four, Chair. And myself, I'm for it. Uh, and uh, that has been carried. Thank you for that, James. So quick. Uh, members, that concludes tonight's uh, planning meeting at 20, uh, 1938.